Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to another uh, another round of our virtual uh, seminar speaker series here. And uh, this is going to be moderated by Jessica Lee and uh, and presented by Laura Cray. So we're excited to have Laura with us on a fantastic topic. Um, before I hand it over to Jessica uh, for any further introductions, I do wanna touch upon a couple of housekeeping items here in regard to the organization itself, International Association for Conflict Management. And there are two important items um, you know, coming up here. Uh, we have our much anticipated um, and, and delayed from 2021, uh, conference in Thessaloniki, Greece. We are going to be at the Macedonia Palace Hotel. Uh, it is the only hotel in Thessaloniki there that is on the Thermaic Gulf. If you look in your chat box right now, I've just provided you some information. It's going to be uh, running from uh, July 9th through 12th, 2023. And there is some preliminary information on the website right now, uh, including when some deadlines are going to be in, in terms of uh, the hotel bookings. We're actually going to open up the hotel bookings relatively soon because we have a fairly early deadline of about April 23rd uh, once our, our booking, our group uh, block closes. So everybody's going to uh, want to and need to get right on that in order to take advantage of it. Uh, in addition, along the lines of IACM 2023 and Thessaloniki, uh, our call for papers. Our call for papers is going to be opening up in the first week of November. So keep an eye out for that. Um, again, people have been chomping at the bit for this particular uh, site for a few years now. So we anticipate a really significant turnout and we, we hope that you'll uh, will join us for it. The other item is to promote our journal, uh, Negotiation and Conflict Management Research. It is an open access journal, a platinum open access journal. So it's a true open access. There are no fees on any side on either end in terms of uh, publishing or submitting. Um, the uh, the journal's access uh, the journal's website is uh, in the chat box as well. It is hosted by the Carnegie Mellon University uh, Library Publishing uh, Service. Um, they are fantastic. Uh, it is uh, run on the Janeway open source uh, open and open access system. So if you're not familiar with it or you haven't looked at it in a while since we shifted away from Wiley as a paid service to this true open access platinum, uh, give it a look. Uh, there's some fantastic resources. The journal is doing phenomenal right now. Um, and it's an exciting thing to be a part of. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica at this point, uh, and I want to thank everybody for being here, and uh, And I'm going to turn my camera off, but if there's any need, just let me know. Okay, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Welcome to the IACM monthly research seminar. So the goal of this seminar is to support the IACM community by providing an opportunity to meet throughout the year and learn from scholars and practitioners. Uh, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm an assistant professor at Georgia Tech in organizational behavior. So I'm one of the four moderators for the seminar. The other ones are Celine uh, Kessiber, Jean Cao, and Michelle Men. So we're very grateful to have Laura Clay with us today. And the title of her talk is Who are the Flirts? An Examination of Gender Differences in Strategic Flirtation. So Laura is a professor of management at UC Berkeley. She is an expert on the role of gender stereotypes and the mindset on workplace behaviors, such as negotiation, leadership, and ethical decision-making. Her work has been supported multiple times by the NSF and has been recognized by multiple research awards from the IACM and AOM. She's an outgoing co-editor-in-chief at the Research and Organizational Behavior, and her research has been featured by pretty much every prestigious media outlet, such as New Yorker, Forbes, HBR, New York Times, Times, and Washington Post. So this session is scheduled to last 45 minutes. The first 25 minutes are for the speaker to present her research, and then we'll open up for questions in the last 20 minutes. So we are recording the session. If you don't want to ask questions and be recorded, you can put your questions in the chat function. So I will be monitoring that. Okay, let's welcome our speaker, Laura Cray. Laura, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the, the warm introduction, Jessica, and it's, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I was thinking back to my very first IACM was literally my first year of graduate school. I was up in Seattle and IACM was in Eugene, Oregon. 
and that was my you know first conference first conference presentation and um it's it's really wonderful to see um friends and, and new faces on on this uh zoom tonight um and i'm very much looking forward to seeing everybody in person in greece um so what i'm going to talk to you about today as i said 25 minutes is not a lot of time and so i'm kind of uh, using it as an opportunity to to share old findings and some more recent findings and trying to make sense of you know stereotypes that people have about who who are the flirts and you know what is 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 there a stable gender difference in terms of self identifying as a flirt and are there situational moderators that turn on and turn off this gender difference so this topic um is certainly um, relevant to you know what we've seen um, this wave of consciousness raising around sexual harassment in the workplace um, the me too movement launched in 2017 brought to light you know a host of of uh, problematic sexual behavior in the workplace and in in terms of making sense of this behavior um, you know, there's a, a, a wide literature on it, um, you know, some work suggesting that, you know, we want to think about these behaviors as moral failings and, you know, to the extent that we can regulate, you know, moral behavior, then perhaps um, some of these, you know, issues will subside. Um, some work frames it in terms of, you know, a sex drive gone awry, gone haywire, um, you know, sexual attraction, um, certainly with Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood, um, you know, many of his victims were very glamorous um, Hollywood act actors. And so, um, you know, there, there may be a sexual attraction component. And I would say from, you know, the social psychological literature, most of the work that speaks directly to this is, um, you know, about the psychology of power. And we can think about Harvey Weinstein, we can think about, you know, all of these men who have been, you know, sort of taken down um, in this movement, generally are very high power men. And so it's easy to assume that some of their behavior derives from them taking advantage, being feeling disinhibited from their power um, because they're in, in positions of power. And you know, it's also important to remember that um, you know, most positions of power are occupied by men in the workplace. And so it could be, you know, epiphenomenal in the sense of just because we more often see this happening with high power men, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the power that's causing it. Um, and so we wanted to explore that intersection of gender and power. Um, and here, you know, another example of a high power ma man uh, sort of being taken down by um, inappropriate sexual behavior at work is uh, Andrew Cuomo, former governor of New York. He um, actually put out a press release in which he stated, you know, that he think he sees himself, his behavior as being playful, joking, teasing, just trying to lighten the mood in a serious business. And yeah, maybe it was unwanted flirtation. You know, sort of the, the gist of this is I'm a big flirt. Um, and while it's easy to, um, you know, sort of chalk that up as just the rationalization and excuse for his behavior, um, we also know sort of drawing from decades of research in social psychology that if you want to understand behavior you know follow the self um, as hazel marcus said last uh february in in her award address at another you know prestigious society you know the answer to the question of who am i grounds attention thinking feeling motivation and action so if we take andrew cuomo at his word Right. It, it could be the case that he genuinely does see himself as a flirt and that self perception motivates behavior, the behavior reinforces the self identity, the self perception, etc. And so what we wanted to, um, you know, so this is probably a familiar sort of um, logic to, to many of you. I mean, again, even with um, moral ethical behavior, we know that moral identity, the extent to which people say that they care about being honest and, and, and you know, sort of um, 
not being deceptive does in fact predict more ethical behavior. And so um, drawing on that same logic, we wondered whether, you know, whether there's something about uh, an identity as a flirt or more formally a social sexual identity that will shed light on the dynamics of social sexual behavior, including harassment. So uh, definitionally, social sexual identity is the self-definition as a person who leverages sex appeal in pursuit of personally valued goals. And those valued goals can be a range of things. It could be affiliation, it could be power, it could be entertainment, it could be um, you know, instrumental. Um, so we're, we're sort of agnostic in terms of uh, what those goals are. Um, and social sexual behavior has been defined in the literature as you know, a wide range of workplace workplace behaviors that have a sexual component but are not task related. So, you know, two actors on a set who are, you know, um, acting a romantic scene, that is not social sexual behavior by this definition, but it could include harassment, it could include flirting, it could include sexual innuendo, the banter that, that Cuomo um, referred to. Um, in terms of, you know, establishing a stereotype, you know, we've we've conducted research, just surveys asking people, who do you think are bigger flirts, men or women? And overwhelmingly, you know, predominantly people associate flirting with women. Um, whether that's true or not, that's sort of what we're trying to, to get to the bottom of. Some of my earlier research studied feminine charm as a combination of friendliness and flirtation and looked at the effect that it might have on distributive negotiations. And so in a vignette study, we asked people to imagine you're selling your car, it's worth $1,200 in the US, you know, US dollars, and you're selling it to a potential buyer named Sue. And we manipulated how Sue interacted with, with um, the participants. In the control condition, basically Sue was, was all business. You know, she looked you directly in the eye, said, I'm looking forward to talking over the financials with you and working out a deal. Let's get down to business. And then somewhat seriously, she says, what's your best price? In the feminine charm condition, um, the way she approached the situation was more consistent with, with Cuomo's, you know, sort of um, approach. She said she looked you up and down, leans forward, briefly touches your arm and says, you're even more charming in person than over email. Then playfully, she winks and says, what's your best price? So this, you know, what we found is that when, for men at least, um, when Sue, you know, interacted with them using feminine charm, they offered her a better price on the car, lower, you know, lower sale price than when she acted in a all business way. So, you know, again, this says nothing about who does this more. And, you know, we don't have the data here on if it, instead of Sue, it were Sam, you know, interacting with, with women and whether this would be effective. But, it, you know, it's an initial demonstration that as a tactic um, to, you know, sort of a distributive tactic under certain circumstances, it may be effective. Now, of course, you know, this research is not to, to cast judgment on what's good or bad. It's just to understand the psychology behind it. Um, and we think it's consistent with, so in other research, we found that when women engage in feminine charm, they are in fact perceived as more powerful. And so in the relationship between flirtation and politics, flirtation functions as power, right? It's a, you know, a norm violation, it's breaching social distance, it's consistent with how we think about what power is. Um, and so this ability to dominate the other partner, to grab their attention, if nothing else, is consistent with how we think about power. Um, now that said, <laughs> um, leading with sexual power is risky business, especially for women. Um, while Donald Trump, the reality TV star, once said on his show, advised women to, quote, use their God-given assets, um, in an interview in Forbes magazine, he acknowledged that women have a tough situation, 
um, because of the, at work because of the sexual undertones. The business environment is so cutthroat that men and women learn to use whatever they can to get ahead, including their sexuality. However, when women do this, the perception of them changes. That's why women have to work harder to overcome obstacles. So even the, you know, grab them by the, you know what, uh, acknowledges that, that that may not be a strategy that works for women. Um, and so what we thought in this work is that perhaps men are going to identify more as flirts than women are because, you know, even in the domain of heterosexual romantic, you know, courtship, uh, men traditionally are the ones who um, initiate. Um, we know that there are sexual double standards, as Trump acknowledged, that women are going to pay a price for this more than men. Um, and, you know, women who sexualize even their appearance um, pay a price, experience backlash, especially when they're in positions of power. So we thought that men might embrace their sexuality more than women and identify it with more strongly. And this might explain why we see men in particular initiating social sexual behavior. So in a first study, we just wanted to see do, is there a gender difference in identification or internalization of social sexual identity? Um, saying that, it, you know, this is something that matters to me. It's an important part of who I am. And so what we did is we contrasted a social sexual identity with a moral identity, and we used a paradigm, you know, developed by Carla Aquino and colleagues, asking people, you know, we're going to give you a list, and I'll show you on the next screen what that list is. And I want you to imagine, you know, a person who has these characteristics. And so the, the items, you know, for social sexual identity, and we did a bunch of, you know, sort of pilot testing and pre-testing to identify some traits that people associated with being a, a flirt. So having sex appeal, flirtatious, irresistible, body language, charm, playful, big flirt, and using personal assets to their advantage. Um, and so then we gave people these traits and then the dependent variable is identity internalization, just asking them essentially how important is it to you to be a person who has these characteristics. And this was a between subjects design. So they either saw social sexual identity or moral identity. And consistent with um, some work I've done with Jessica Kennedy and Jillian Koo, we replicated that women identify more with moral identity traits than men do. They internalize those traits more. But we also see a gender difference on the social sexual identity with men saying that they care more about um, these traits than, than women do. And, you know, certainly it's, uh, you know, an obvious question to ask, well, maybe women just weren't admitting to this because there may be a social penalty. So we have run studies where we include and control for socially desirable responding and, and this gender difference is, is robust to that. So after we asked them how important it is, it is it to you to be a person who has these traits? Then we gave people a scenario in which imagine you work for this company and um, you're going to start working with a colleague on a series of tasks and we manipulated it. So in, in this research, um, we did focus on people who identify as, as men or women and who also um, self-reported being um, heterosexual or straight. So we always put people, paired people with an opposite sex um, task partner. And we gave people pictures of who that person is and said, you've been working together for a year and you, know, you have a good relationship. And then we ask people, how likely would they be to engage in the following behaviors, to initiate these behaviors? And this is these are items taken from uh, work by Shepard et al. on social sexual behavior. Um, when this behavior is welcomed, um, they find that it can ha have stress relieving benefits, um, that if, if you have a workplace, you know, flirt partner, someone you have a crush on and you both enjoy the banter, it can actually, you know, have some positive effects. So, but their research, how they measured it is how often have you received these behaviors? Here we're asking people how often, you know, would you be likely to initiate these behaviors? And what we found is that men report being more likely to initiate the behaviors. 
and that this difference is mediated both by their greater social sexual identity and their weaker moral identity. Um, and when we experimentally manipulated these identities rather than just measuring them as we do here correlationally, we found that only the social sexual identity caused a change in the social sexual behavior. So using a priming paradigm, we found that if you prime people to get into the mindset of a social sexual identity, then they become you know, more likely to initiate these behaviors. Um, so then we wanted to focus on gender moderators of these gender differences and of this gender difference and when what turns it on, what turns it off, and what are the implications for power. Um, you know, we know that the concept of power is central to understanding behavior like such sexual harassment, although we know less about how power leads or contributes to sexual harassment. Um, most of the power literature, um, you know, certainly this is changing, but you know, traditionally a lot of the power literature, the social psychological, you know, experimental work often contrasts high power to a control condition where we don't even have a low power condition. So it makes it really hard to know um, what exactly um, role power is playing. Um, and we know that social sexual behavior, you know, oftentimes is ambiguous. There's plausible deniability, right? There's, um, you know, it, it creates ambiguity in the interaction and that in and of itself could disrupt what are otherwise stable hierarchies, right? Gender hierarchies or, or even, you know, sort of power-based hierarchies. Um, and we know as far as the work by David Winter on the power motive that when men are high in the power motive uh, as compared to women who are high in the power motive. So although he doesn't find gender differences in the mean level of power motive, he does find that when men are high in the power motive, they're more likely to engage in these profligate behaviors like gambling, drinking, you know, um, unprotected sex, et cetera. So it could be that we're going to see these gender differences more pronounced when the motive, the desire for power is, is prevalent. And when we think about different, you know, sort of the interpersonal circumplex and different motives that people have in, in, in social interactions, um, when people have a self-transcendent motive, which is more about affiliation and benevolence and responsibility, that's incompatible with self-enhancement motives like power, dominance, and control. And so we thought that perhaps if we activate the self-transcendent motive, that we would minimize gender differences by reducing the extent to which men identify as flirts. And, you know, there's a whole literature, different literatures on what we could think of as compensatory or low power flirting. Um, I'm not going to go through this all in, in detail in the interest of time, but se sexual economics theory is all about, you know, I'm going to trade my, you know, sort of sexuality for resources. And oftentimes that, you know, they're locating that in women. And, you know, there are certainly examples in history, we can think of Mad Men and, you know, and, and actual, you know, sort of sociological studies documenting how women who've historically been in low power positions may, you know, sort of flirt with their bosses to um, improve their treatment in the workplace. Um, and in, you know, sort of theorizing around social sexual behavior, Aquino and colleagues, um, you know, acknowledged that they didn't see it as bounded by gender, although they did you know, postulate that it is arguably rational for women to make more frequent use of this advantageous resource than do men. You know, with the idea being that women are, you know, have less power and status in society and in organizations, so it may motivate this behavior in women. So in this study, which we ran on online, we manipulated, we, you know, we set it up a, a workplace simulation and we said, imagine you are, you know, about to work with a, 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 another colleague and we set it up. So again, it was an opposite sex, you know, colleague. And we said, you know, gave people very explicitly what their goal was in the interaction. And we had two different self-enhancement motives. Um, we've done some pretests to show that they both equally activate this desire for self-enhancement, whether it be based on influence or autonomy. And we contrasted that with self-transcendent motives. Um, and we 
you know, told people you're explicitly trying to affiliate and establish a good relationship with this person. We also had a control condition where we didn't give people any um, explicit goals. And thankfully, that that actually aligned with the affiliative motive. So yeah. the baseline. Oh. I'm sorry, I, there's a little bit of chatter in the background. Okay, so um, so we manipulated, we, we collapsed the two self-enhancement motives. We manipulated whether they're pursuing self-enhancement or self-transcendence. And then we, um, you know, we measured um, their social sexual identity and, and, you know, kind of more elaborate sentences on, you know, based on what you saw in the first study. And what we found is that when people um, were adopted the self-enhancement motive, they did in fact strengthen their social sexual identity. They reported being big, you know, kind of seeing themselves as flirts more. This was true for men and women alike. And we also found a gender difference that men, you know, had a stronger social sexual identity than women. We didn't see an interaction on this measure. We also um, developed a task. So we said, you're, you know, you're going to be working with this person on a series of tasks. Before you begin, we want you to give you the opportunity to get acquainted. And so we gave them, they didn't see this all together. They were given a series of choices between two questions. You can either ask your partner, you know, have you ever had a workplace conflict? Or you can ask, have you ever had a workplace relationship? We pre-tested these so that the questions on the right column were perceived to be more flirtatious, inappropriate, and, you know, so it's kind of innuendo, right? Um, some more than others. Um, and so then we computed how often do people select the sexual questions? That was our dependent variable. And what we found is that um, in the self-transcendence condition where people are seeking affiliation, uh, there was no gender difference in the selection of, you know, in initiating SSB. Whereas in the self-enhancement condition, men were significantly more likely to select those questions than women were. In a final study I wanna share with you, we actually, you know, conducted a study in the lab and, you know, we brought people, in, brought undergrads in, we set it up similarly, only they really thought that the person was in the next room and that they were gonna begin working with them for an hour. And, you know, we asked them again, they, they filled out a bunch of bogus leadership assessments and we, you know, didn't score them. We randomly assigned them to be the boss or the subordinate. And they were always paired with an opposite sex other. And we said in, you know, in, the, in a few minutes, that person's going to come in and you're going to start working together. But before you do, we want you to get acquainted. So we gave them the same task. And again, what we find is that in the self-transcendence condition, which is actually the high power condition here. So we ran some pretests, and in this, you know, context, high power being the boss actually you know, motivated people to want to affiliate and be responsible. Um, whereas in the low power condition, when they were subordinate, they were more likely to say, I want more power. Right? I want to sort of gain control and I want more dominance. And it was under that condition that men significantly increased their um, initiation of SSB. Um, women, although those differences look like they should be significant, they, there actually is no difference between uh, the women didn't change across the conditions, just the men. Um, and what we found is that this increase in the initiation of SSB by men when they're in the low power condition, which again is when they are in this self-enhancement motive um, mindset, that it was mediated, their, their initiation of SSB was mediated by a strengthening of their social sexual identity. So... We think this research um, provides a new explanation for a wide range of social sexual behavior, including sexual harassment and highlighting really the role of identity and who we think we are. Um, and hopefully this can help to illuminate the mindset of potential harassers, um, you know, seeing yourself as a flirt. Um, some of the behavior may be relatively benign, but we all know that um, you know, behaviors can escalate without us even realizing. And when we're, we're rationalizing it as it's just who I am. Um, so hopefully that is a novel insight. And we also um, contribute to the psychology of power um, in understanding how it works. Um, it points to the importance of situations 
that activate the self-enhancement motive. So it may not be that power corrupts, but rather the, the desire for power that is most problematic. And we know, and you know, to, to the degree that flirting is something that people enjoy doing, um, we might be on the lookout for, you know, when is it going to be less problematic? There's my timer. When is it going to be less problematic? Um, it may be when there's consensus around it. And at least as far as the group differences between men and women, we see that um, when people adopt the self-transcendent motives. Um, it also speaks to just briefly, you know, so again, the psychology of power, um, some, you know, good friends of mine have posited that um, that gender differences are reducible to power differences. And again, what we're finding here is that's true under the high power condition, which is consistent with the literature that generally compares high power to control conditions. Men and women were acting identically in the high power conditions or when they were seeking self transcendence. But the difference that emerged under the low power condition cannot be reduced, you know, it, it suggests that there's something unique about gender that can't just be reduced to power. Um, and here I just thought this was funny, so I'm going to include it. <laughs> Agreed there's a middle ground between stay the course and cut and run, but I'm quite certain it's not dance and flirt. So <laughs> when we are seeking power, um, there may be alternatives um, and that are less risky. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators on the feminine charm work. That's Constant Locke and Alex Van Zant, And then on this more recent work on social sexual identity behavior, I want to acknowledge Jessica Kennedy and Mike Rosenblatt. So I want to thank you all for listening attentively, and I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you so much, Laura. So for the audience, if you want to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and preferably also turn on your camera so that you can ask Laura directly, or you can put your question in the chat and I'll repeat your question. Um, I can ask a question. Hi, Ray. Hi. Hey, Laura. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where this fits, but the idea of um, where someone perceives that it's risky, in risky progress. to make uh, a social sexual action. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I, uh, it seems like some people presume that it's OK or that the, that the norms in the world is structured in a way that it won't have repercussions or for them and others like are aware of repercussions. And I don't know how that fits in, you know, to the different idea of wanting power, having power, willing to take risk, presumption of whether, you know, uh, there is there is risk in such a- yeah. yeah, well, so we, yeah, I mean, that's a good question and it certainly makes a difference. I mean, I may further moderate, you know, if we, gender by power by, you know, risk assessment. Um, I will say that in, in the many, many, you know, sort of pretests that we did and, you know, sort of in responding to very reasonable, you know, questions by reviewers, we, um, you know, I mean, we ran studies at showing people these questions, you know, in this paradigm, the get acquainted paradigm. And asking them, you know, how offended would you be if someone asked you this in this context? How offended do you think most men would be? How offended do you think most women would be? And what we basically found is that women are more offended than men are, and men know that women are more offended than, than men are. So, you know, under this context, it wasn't like they thought that this was welcome behavior generally. So um, it suggests that, you know, some of seeking power may, you know, the, you know, there's the whole spectrum of SSB, the, the benign and the harassment, we're not making too many claims about where this falls, but it does suggest that um, people are to some extent aware that some of this behavior is not invited. And so that puts it more in the camp of, you know, a dominance tactic as opposed to, oh, I just thought that this is what everyone does. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was thinking that you know, people high in social sexual identity might be at this game repeatedly across their life. And so there's a kind of a learning of, you know, uh, tolerance for it in their yeah. personal experience, whereas maybe those lower in social sexual identity, you know, have have not had any experience with this and therefore wouldn't 
you know, wouldn't presume that it could be gotten away with. Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, one of the things I'll just mention in terms of presenting this work through the years, and is that it runs the gamut in terms of how people in the audience react. I mean, I, even just you know, men coming up to me after the talk and saying, "I cannot believe that your undergraduate students would ask any of those questions," to other people saying, "This has nothing to do with harassment." You know, so it's it's it is in the eye of the beholder, and I don't know if that correlates with their own, you know, social sexual identity. I have a quick comment. Your presentation just reminded me of a paper by Vanessa Bond and Laura Vinson. I put it in the chat. Um, they found that receiver of romantic moves actually found it harder to reject it than the the giver believes. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, flirts thought, the flirts knew that others don't really want to receive the flirts. So I thought this might be related. Oh yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. I did not know that worked. So that that's super um, relevant. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm certain, yeah, right. So there's a disconnect and and people may think like, oh, if, if, if they don't like it, they'll let me know. Right, without realizing the barriers that exist. At the same time, they may say, "Well, yeah, maybe, maybe they don't want it, but it's, it's, you know, they're, they're going to minimize the the perceived harm, right? Because that just is how the sort of rationalization process works." If I may ask a follow up question, I was wondering whether certain individuals don't perceive themselves as flirts whereas others see them as first. They might think I'm just being charismatic and I'm natural this way. Do you see, have you documented a discrepancy between their self-beliefs versus others' perceptions? Well, I I mean, not not exactly, but I, I mean, I there is some work on, you know, I'm thinking of the work on sexual over-perception. And I, I think that there's work that, you know, men are more likely to think that a woman is sexually attracted to them when in fact she's just, you know, interacting. And so that may be where she thinks she's just, you know, being friendly and her interaction partner perceives her as more of a flirt, right? I mean, so to the extent that if it is a erroneous stereotype that women are bigger flirts, then it suggests that some of the time people think that you're flirting when in fact you're not. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Zach? I had a question of like, what is, what is the essence of, of flirting? Like, what does it, what does it mean? And, and, and cause I feel like the term flirt is a pejorative label that's applied to a behavior. And, you know, I mean, like, for example, jargon is all like, maybe I'm studying objectively, but it's also a label and I can manipulate whether you think something is jargon or not based on like the person's trying to manipulate you and then it shoots up or like they're low status. And then my evaluation, you know, my, my judgment of the thing. So it's, it's almost like an evaluative judgment applied to an objective thing. And that, that judgment maybe changes, whereas the objective thing maybe did not change at all. And so, cause, and, and there's like related to like playfulness or like yep. what's what's mm -hmm. the essence of it is it like the unreciprocatedness of it is it like well, um, so you know, there's a, it, or like sexual band I mean like can men flirt with other men you know women flirt with other women are there like interactions where because I see that with other men so you know there's like a playfulness kind of there might be sexual banter or other things where I don't I mean I don't you know the harassment label also aside mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. like I'm just not entirely sure when when we're referring to flirt like what's what's the real like essence of what it is versus what, you know, what's the objective thing that I can see without looking at the person's response, you know, and whether or not it's reciprocated and whether or not it's like a work context or yeah. not. Maybe, well, that's, that, maybe that's definitional to it. I don't know. Well, right. I mean, so there's this idea of, and I'm not going to remember who, where I got this quote, but it's, it's the idea of flirting is fine, but being a flirt is not. Right. So there are contexts in which flirting is quite, you know, has a very positive connotation. But when you become a flirt, right, it means that you sort of lead with this and in a way that may have more negative connotations because it, it's sort of the over application of it. And generally means probably, I mean, it may be a function as well of like physical attractiveness, right? People are not going to be, you know, in on average, going to be more receptive to platonic, even platonic flirting, 
from somebody that they perceive to be attractive um, than less attractive. So I think that it's, um, you know, flirting is sort of a breach of social distance. It's, um, it's been defined as, um, you know, sexual behavior that's not serious, right? It, it is teasing. I mean, it, I, I think of Dacher Keltner's work on teasing, right? It's a way, it's, it's playful, teasing, joking, it's ambiguous. And again, there's, that's where it, it can, and in his work on teasing, I mean, he general, he studies, you know, same sex interactions and shows that, you know, this teasing can be a way to reduce, you know, reinforce and or reduce hierarchy. And, and so I think that flirting is a multidimensional, you know, sort of, you could think of it in the literature, you can think of it in in romance. You you know, trying to focus it on it in the workplace. I think I'm very cautious about you know putting it in the it's just playful banter category because it's so easily misinterpreted, and 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 unprofessional. But I mean, obviously, there's a wide range of what people believe. Or, or we would, I mean, some of the harassment of like quid pro quo obviously is like really extreme. But most harassment, I mean, the literature on harassment even finds most of it is not power based. It's between two people of equal power in organizations. So there's something about this sort of sexual behavior that um, is um, transcends power, I guess. And, and some of it must be, you know, well received by, by, you know, by people. So I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting topic because it's so complex. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. I'll just read it for everyone from April Xu. So she asked, is there a gender difference in the need for power or in the tendency to engage in a self-enhancement mindset when people, both male and female, are in the low power condition? Yeah, no, I mean, we we ran some tests where we tried, you know, put people into that, and then we directly asked them about their need for power. And if I'm not mistaken, we did not find gender differences. So again, it's the low power may activate the need for power for both men and women. But going back to Winter's work, it's men in particular, when they have a need for power, that can engage in some of the less desirable behaviors more so than women. And, and, you know, he attributes that not to women are, you know, perfect is that women generally have been socialized more to be responsible with power. And I think in some of his work, you know, he, he talks about moderators, like if you're the first born child, right, where you've had to, you know, sort of raise your siblings, you, you are more responsible with power. So men in a high, high in the need for power who, associate power with responsibility are going to be less likely to engage in these behaviors. So I want to be respectful of people's time. Um, we are at here in my time zone, I'm at 11.45 p.m. So I will <laughs> post the information about our next talk. Our speaker is Bird um, Gigorenza. Um, she's He is a German psychologist and that will be hosted on October the 10th. But we can stay a little longer. If you have more questions to ask, ask, ask Laura, but if you have to uh, log off, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. <laughs>
having this measure and, and ways of studying it to stimu stimulate future research. And Horia, you said to look at it. I can't read. What did you want to speak? Just just longitudinally. So, you know, I was thinking about how whether this is more of a trait that people develop at a, you know, in their teenage years and it just sort of sticks with them throughout time or whether it's something that people sort of um, develop over time and sort of come in and out of. So, but I think that there's really an interesting, exciting um, follow-up work to be done. So it's cool. Thank you. Yeah. And certainly, you know, people's relationship status, right? I mean, it, it, how does that impact, right? And, you know, what, I mean, does it, does it moderate it? And that was one of my questions. It is just flirting, yeah. then maybe, you know, if you're, if it's just dispositional and you're just flirting, then we all know that, you know, that, that, that could happen as well. So, um, yeah. Very cool. Related to Zach's question, there might be an industry difference as well. I can mm. imagine this phenomenon more common in our business setting rather than a very engineering culture. In sales and yeah, right. I mean, which is really cool to think about like the work on, you know, is it deceptive? I mean, is it, if it's insincere, right, then there's, it's almost, there's a form of deception to it. And, you know, it's driven by, you know, instrumental goals. And so I'm thinking of, um, you know, Emma Levine and Brian Gunia's work on, you know, sort of different industries and how they, you know, sort of respond to, deceptive negotiating tactics and um and this could explain you know some of the behavior in the tech industry in terms of i don't you know if if somebody is you know as you're saying the engineers if if they have i don't know if it's true but you know stereotypically people will say oh they have less social intelligence and and you know they're more techy and so does that mean that they you know, kind of do this more inappropriately because they, they're not reading the room up, you know, in the right way. I don't know. So many intriguing questions. I look forward to reading your papers when they get published. Thank you, Thank you so <laughs> we'll much. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. much. I really appreciate everybody showing up at strange times. And um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. look forward I hope to, to seeing see everyone you. in Greece. Yeah, I hope we get to see you in Greece. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Bye-bye.